Welcome to the Embodiment Podcast. This show is for you if you see the body as more than a brain taxi. It's for people interested in coming home to the body as a holistic aspect of who we are and how we live. Episodes contain practical tips, exercises you can take away, and interviews with embodiment specialists from around the world. I'm your host, Mark Walsh. So on the show today, Sindra Hager Andreessen. So I probably pronounced your surname wrong, Cindy, but I uh, <laughs> hope you'll forgive me. So Sindra, I've known for a few years. I uh, came to EFC. He's a chronic pain uh, therapist. So we're going to talk a lot about pain today. He's got a strong background in Kung Fu, went to the Shaolin Temple, bodywork, yoga, meditation, and shamanism. So Sindra, welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. In Norway today? I'm in Oslo, yes. Just came back from a nice crisp swim in the cold fjords yeah. of oslo that's so viking okay uh, how did you get interested in the body what was your route into this uh... well um i picked up uh, i've always been interested in sports and i picked up judo when i was 11 which was interesting but the real the real turnaround for me in terms of health and embodiment uh, and how we are came when I was around 18, 19. And it was uh, my own health that was the sort of catalyst to that process. Because uh, I had lots of chronic pain, I had digestive issues, I was depressed, I had drug issues. Uh, so that's really what led me into exploring yoga and everything else. And uh, yeah. It's, and where, where did that take you? So you, you were a fucked up teenager. Mm-hmm. You, you suddenly realize how blonde you were and it freaked you out, freaked you out. Yeah. And, uh, and, and then how did you end up in the Shaolin temple? Cause that's part of your story I've heard before. Mm-hmm. True. Um, it was very random. My, uh, my little brother, uh, was, who was 17 at the time, uh, found a school online and went, I'm going here. And when I heard him say that I felt something in my gut, and I went, me too, almost before uh, I could think. Uh, and so we did that six months later. Wow. And what, what are some of the other things you've discovered? Because I know you're a big body worker, myofascial stuff. You know, you've, 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 done, you've done quite a lot of stuff. So what, tell us that journey. How did you discover these other things? Yeah, so first I tried to fix my own body with yoga and food. Uh, and I had some success. I had less pain. My posture improved. I got stronger. I felt healthier. But there was still uh, lots of issues. I still had back pain. And uh, I was still searching for something that uh, would work a little better than yoga because I was using perhaps two hours a day doing yoga. Oh, are we going to bad mouth yoga, Sindra, today? Can, can Sorry, we have what? a little bit? We can, can we have a yoga bash today? Are we going to bash yoga a little bit together today like we normally do? We can bash yoga a little bit for sure. Uh, definitely, like, where I'm at with yoga now is that I think it's um, inadequate to deal with the problems that uh, we have specifically in our culture. It's not designed for people who sit as much as we do. We need, mm. uh, we need something else first. Say more about that. Let's just dive in there then. So you were finding yeah. inadequate for you. Like, like sometimes, you know, people may have heard like sitting is the new smoking and it's been a bit of a big thing the last few years or they might have missed that completely. So like, what's the problem with sitting down? I mean, it's comfortable. I'm sitting down now. It's lovely. Like, what's the problem? I agree. It's very, it's very comfortable. Uh, The problem is that the brain perceives that as a zero gravity situation. There are no signals from the muscles on the back to the brain. And the response from the brain uh, from that situation after a bit of time is to start to remove the parts that represent, for example, your butt in the brain. So the map the brain has of the body becomes uh, less clear and uh, more confusing for the brain to deal with. So when you stand up, the signal from the brain to the muscles is weaker. Uh, This is going to result in compression in your posture and in your joints which is uh, perceived as very threatening. For the so, so sensory motor amnesia, that actually kind of forgetting, and uh, this is certainly, and I just asked listeners as well, is that their subjective experience? Because mine is if I've been sitting doing admin work all day, for example, which is kind of two days and five for me, maybe, mm-hmm. like, it's almost like I don't have a body by the end of the day. You know, it's like I forg- my body has forgotten it, it, it exists kind of thing and also just emotionally I feel like shit like if I do a whole week in the office I feel depressed 
And I, it's so different when I'm standing up and teaching. There's other variables there, but I, I've come to think that the, just the sitting is, is a big part of that. The thing is a, is a massive part of that. There's another factor as well that uh, happens when you sit, and that's, there's a gene called the LPP1 gene that is uh, switched off when you sit. And that gene uh, suppresses inflammation and blood clotting. Uh, so when you sit for too long, you get blood clotting, meaning, meaning the red blood cells uh, lump together and they can carry oxygen less effect- effectively. Is this proper science syndrome or is this some dodgy paper that you read on the internet? Come on. This, this is NASA uh, science. So very well established and researched and they've spent years. So- so I guess NASA spent a lot of time looking at this because they were looking at different gravity environments or, you know, astronauts kind of sitting down for a long time in zero gravity or they yeah, researched they this uh, from, from the astronauts. Exactly. It was by chance they discovered this because of sending people to outer space. They realized that the analysts in NASA that was sitting down all day, they had very similar damages all the way down to their DNA level. And that's why they started to look at what happens when you sit down or lie down for longer periods of time. Interesting. And why is yoga not enough to do with that? I mean, I, I find yoga, I feel good from yoga. It seems to, you know, I do back bends, for example, after I've been sitting all day to kind of open up that front kind of collapse that happens. You know, I find it quite nice to do a bit of yin over a bolster or something, kind of stretch out that front line. Like, why, why is that not enough? Well, the thing is that when you have a sensory motor amnesia and you can't feel your body and you can't really access uh, several of your muscles efficiently, when you go into these yoga postures, they are not designed with that in mind. It's very, it's mm. very easy to actually create more compression in your joints and worsen the situation long-term uh, with yoga, especially if you have a teacher who hasn't been adequately trained in anatomy and neurology. Mm. which is okay so it's not just a matter of sort of stretching out backwards because i often just like on the most I mean, you know my anatomy is not as good as yours but it often just feels like i'm sort of collapsed and slumped forwards and everything's kind of squidged forwards mm-hmm. it's not as simple as simply stretching out backwards the other way well it's a it's a it's a temporary re- relief and it feels mm. great and it increases blood flow and i mean there's uh, plenty of good things with stretching uh, i stretch it feels really good Uh, but regaining neurological connection and a functional neurological connection between the muscles and the brain after extended periods of sitting, it requires something a little bit different. It requires uh, eccentric loading of the muscles, meaning you create length in your muscles by putting your skeleton in a position that forces that, and then you uh, stay there for a bit to force your muscles to work where they are long, and what happens then is when you stand up again, they contract and you regain that connection between the muscles and the brain. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so it's almost like a Feldenkrais kind of learning learning about how you move and learning those kind of deeper postural muscles rather than just kind of stretching superficially. And this is the foundation training, right? Because Eric Goodman is it and there's this yeah. kind of whole system based around this. Well, yeah. Can you say something a little bit about what that system is? Maybe we'll get him on the show sometime, but assuming we don't, could you uh, give us yeah. the, the basics of that? So uh, foundation training is a system that Eric Goodman created as a uh, necessity because he had his own back pain and he was in chiropractic school. He was studying a lot of uh, different new uh, ways of looking at anatomy, like anatomy trains by Thomas Myers and combining this with his knowledge of training. And it's, it's a method of how you decompress your body with your own muscle strength. So it's calisthenic exercises that you stay in for a bit and you breathe um, something in a way that we call decompression breathing that forces your um, vertebra in your spine to be created more space between them by the turning of the ribs. Uh, you will feel very, very uplifted and strong mm. and light because uh, it's designed to make you really, really good at gravity. Mm-hmm. 
And I mean, you do have a beautiful poise to you, Stinger. Now, the, the listeners don't realise, but you are a remarkably good-looking fellow. And um, you, you, not just in terms of sort of physically, but you have a certain sort of poise or elongation. Some of the things you've been talking about is a aesthetic as well as a functional quality to that kind of embodiment, right? For sure. And um, I was looking at the body very mechanically for a long time, actually, until I met you. And um, the embodiment work really helped that to make that elongated posture more elegant, more fluid. Maybe you could say something a little bit about that journey then. So someone that has a very good background in kind of biomechanics and, you know, you can explain things in terms beyond that I can. Um, and yet that's still a mechanistic kind of model, isn't it? So what was the when you did the FC and you started meeting people like Paul Linden and some of the other embodiment teachers that I introduced you to, like what was, what was the gain? Cause someone else might be listening to this going, Hey, I know body mechanics. Why do I need this embodiment business? Hmm. Well, it, I think it came from my own journey. Uh, I'm and my own development, which, which is my, uh, I, I would say one of my biggest passions in, in life uh, is, is to figure out how I work and how, what makes me tick and how everything is connected and, and what makes me feel this and how can I shift that. And from the structural work and yoga and looking very mechanically at things, I got a lot better, but I felt very disintegrated in some ways, like very, there's like this part here and this part here. And I had so much knowledge about the different parts and how they worked, but there wasn't this sense of, of integration in, mm-hmm. in my body, you know? Uh, and uh, b- because my work had been very detail focused. Um, and that's what Western anatomy does, right? It cuts things up, it breaks them down, it separates them out. So that kind of makes sense. Also came from the yoga world, actually, where the focus is to like, oh, my, my hip is so close. I, I want to do hip openers or heart openers. And then you focus on that area specifically and locally. And as I was learning more and more in anatomy and in biotensegrity, we know that um, nothing is local in the body in terms yeah, so of structure. I can explain that um, biotensegrity idea, the, the kind of idea is basically everything's kind of linked up and like a web across your whole system, right? So you, you can't just stretch one thing. Exactly. Everything is uh, connected by connective tissue. You can uh, imagine removing everything but connective tissue in the body and you're going to look like a, a cobweb version of yourself. Mm-hmm. You're going to look exactly like yourself. Every little detail is going to be there, but it's going to look like a cobweb, no color, no nothing, just white. Sorry, that's the, that's, this is the, the fascia, the kind of material yeah. that's sort of gunk that would just get taken out in traditional anatomy, but this is actually connecting every single part of the body, you know, threading through the muscles, connecting the skin. Yeah. Um, I just point listeners to uh, Gary Carter's episode on this as well. He's a yoga teacher that focuses on this, and one of the early episodes of the show is with Gary. Um, there's a few other people we've had on the show that have talked about fascia. It's a bit of an obsession for some, for some people in the kind of uh, movement world at the moment. <laughs> I've been there actually with that obsession for like, I had, I had a six month uh, love story with Fasha and then I moved Six on. months. <laughs> and, 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 and so there's Tom Myers as well, right? We haven't had him on the show yet. He's a big name in this field. His movement trains, is it? Anatomy trains? Anatomy trains. What, what's an anatomy train? So it's his word for describing the myofascial links in the body. And his, I mean, there's many systems trying to describe the, the lines of, uh, tension transfer in the body or functional lines but his, his um, thing is to look, look at how is um, tension and force transferred in the system so and how does one part affect the other and how can you reliably read that and know where the issue is so it's like a map so let's say you have an issue in your neck and it's the right side of the neck and I know that there are several muscles connecting there that is actually connected all the way down to the foot. So I'm yep. looking at the foot and start working there. So that's his theory of how to work with these things. Um, he works very, um, he's very Rolfing uh, inspired because he studied with Ida Rolf. So he works uh, with uh, manual therapy, manipulation techniques, a lot of stretching on the skin and 
they, they claim they're stretching the connective tissue, but some research suggests that it's impossible. That's controversial, isn't it? Some people say you can't, you know, obviously all of Rolfing and many other sort of deep tissue schools are built on that. And then there's some evidence now saying you can't really do that. Like certainly when I've cut up cadavers, it, it kind of looks like a tricky thing to stretch. And then the yin yoga people also say they're stretching it. Um, I, I don't know. I don't know the truth of that. Well, um, the way I know about these things is, uh, is, is a neurological perspective on this. Because uh, the ligaments that the yin people are talking about are covered with nerve sheets. And when you work them in a specific way, they will release eventually. And that will sort of be a stretching of the connective tissue, but the mechanism is neurological. And it's the same with Rolfing. The mechanism is neurological how we experience the effect, how it affects us is all neurological. And when we know that it's neurological, we can uh, attune our techniques and our uh, workout program to that. And it works much better, actually. No, I've, often I, I kind of look at the difference between, for example, I just got a, good, I got a nice massage today, traditional sort of Swedish style type massage. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's just, you know, the woman's working very physically on me as it were and then yesterday i did a sort of feldenkrais type lesson with rachel uh, rachel blackman who's been on the show who you know mm-hmm. and that's very different because she's not sort of working on the body as a thing it's actually working with how you your usage and learning to sort of remap uh, like the maps the sort of mental maps you were talking about earlier they they seem to be two quite different ways of approaching body work one where you're much more active and involved and learning essentially and, and the other way you're sort of more just like a piece of meat that's being stretched out and done to, which, you know, it sounds bad, but it also has its bonuses. Like you can just lie there and enjoy it, you know, a bit more yeah. passive. Yeah, mass- massage just uh, has definite upsides uh, also to the immune system and pressure and well-being and all kinds of things, but not, not really to anything structural. And also would like to say that I know, I know Thomas Myers is... Uh, recognizing the neurological now and really moving away from thinking that it's, it's fascia that is stretching just so that is said. Um, but yeah, um, if, if you want to successfully do something with a posture that is, has been affected by the modern lifestyle of sitting too much, you need to address three or in some cases four areas, which is strength on the backside of the body, which is number one. It's the big engine that holds you up, right? Without your butt, you would fall over on all fours and kind of be an ape, right? Yeah. So if if the butt gets really weak, you get more hunched over. Another thing you uh, want to look at is the vestibular system. So the system of balance in our our brain. Mm -hmm. We've been very successful at making our lives easy, right? Everything is flat. We don't uh, challenge our uh, gyro a lot. You know? you know, I noticed this walking in a mountain in Wales two weekends ago with some of the EFC kids was like, um, there's no paths there. You know, there are, there are paths, but there's a lot of shingle and rocks and different angles. And I had to focus all day and my ankles and feet were just being worked in ways. I walk quite a lot. I walk, you know, 10 to 20,000 steps a day just in my life in Brighton. But this was different because it wasn't on paths that we wasn't on like nice new payments and well whole physiology had to work completely differently. Yeah, exactly. There's a lot going on in your brain in that situation uh, that uh, we are not used to doing. And it's, it's a very important system for you to have an upright posture and to be strong because if the, if the connection between the organ of balance and the map your brain has of your body is really bad, which it becomes from sitting a lot and only walking on flat stuff because that's, it's a very one one dimensional thing, you know, to walk on flat stuff in that regards, then your brain is going to feel, uh, and I'm talking about the reptilian part of the brain right now. It's going to feel very threatened by that situation because if something that is really threatening comes around the corner and you need to run from it, you're going to have a big problem. And why this is so important in pain is that pain is a outgoing signal from your brain. 
There's nothing in your body telling your brain that you're in pain. It's your brain deciding that the threat level is so high that you need to experience pain right now. So it could be because you need to do something. About it's a warning it. signal, right? Like, and warning. this is also where people can experience phantom limb pain where there isn't even a hand there. Exactly. They can still experience pain, right? Like, you know, have your hand chopped off and you can still feel pain in that imaginary hand because yeah. your brain can still generate the pain. Yeah. And that's the issue in chronic pain is that the, the brain is perceiving the situation to be so threatening all the time because our lifestyle is so different from the lifestyle we had that this body and system developed in. That's when chronic pain can, can come without any uh, seeming natural cause, you know, like without any mechanical problem or stuff like that, because that's back pain doesn't come from that. I want to get to pain, but before we do, I want to kind of wrap up on sitting a little bit here. So what are your kind of top tips for people who are like me sitting some days a week or even people who maybe are listening to this and they're, you know, they're office workers five, six days a week. Like, I mean, what I have is I just get up a lot. I drink a lot of water. I get up a lot. I hang from a bar. I do little stretches. I take chances to go for walks several times a day. Like I walk to a lunchtime yoga class and back. Like, I mean, beyond just not, standing you know sometimes i stand up when i'm on a phone call for example i'll quite often stand up and walk around to give my body a break from sitting some people have these crazy standing desks which i can't quite bring myself to do um what is your what is your advice for someone who has an office job that does involve a lot of sitting i can begin with nasa's advice which is standing up every 10 minutes and sitting down again in one motion that creates one and a half g in your system and makes your brain go, Whoa, okay, this stuff is important. So as I'm doing this now, it's literally just stand up and sit down like that. Yeah. Every time. As, as fluidly as you can in one motion. So I stand up, and I sit down, it just reminds my legs they kind of exist, right? It, yeah, it reminds your brain about the whole backside of your body, which is the anti-gravity muscles. If you want to like add something to that, you can do a little jump and land on your heels and lift your sternum to the ceiling. Nice. Well, okay. That is one really good thing. And if, if, you, if you consistently do that throughout the day, you're going to feel very, very different at the end of the day. You're going to be clear headed at the end of the day, most likely if your air quality is good. And every 10 minutes is quite a lot. Cause I, I tend to get up for about five minutes every hour. So I'll drink a pint of water, I'll go to the toilet, hug my wife, yeah. feed, you know, water the plants, whatever, just do something for five minutes. So you're saying every 10 minutes is better than just five minutes an hour like I'm currently doing. Yeah, well, to describe what is happening when you're sitting for an hour, you're going to have about 45 minutes of inflammation and blood clotting. That's going to affect your cognitive abilities. It's not, it's not that sounds bad. Why am I dead? <laughs> Because we are very resilient quick creatures. Incredibly <laughs> resilient. Okay, okay. So every 10 minutes, getting up for one minute, you know, this up and down motion, what, what else? Definitely do foundation training. It's the That's, number it's one. It's kind of hard to find, man. It's kind of hard to find. Not everyone can do that. Foundationtraining.com? Yeah, I mean, well, it's, it's not everywhere. There's no foundation trainers in Brighton, as far as I know. Uh, to my knowledge, they're working on that to make it available everywhere. They have free videos available online. Videos um, I've seen. It's some simple, there are some simple ones that I've been able to follow. Mm -hmm. yeah. it's, it's definitely worth at least looking into the decompression breathing and the founder that they're doing. And I mean, even if you're not doing it perfect and you're just experimenting and playing with it, it's going to have a positive effect mm -hmm. uh, on your posture. And this, this is the work that we use to reverse sitting damages or other kinds of postural damages because you can get postural deformities from other things than just sitting. And what's a good, just to jump in again, so what's a good prescription? That, so the founder, that's the um, name of one of the moves. Like what's a good prescription there? Are we talking 10 minutes a day or an hour twice a week? Like what's, you know, I, I know it's as long as it's a string probably, but what would you recommend to someone like me who's probably had some collapse from sitting long term and what, what would be a good training regime? From, from knowing you and knowing your energy levels a bit and knowing you have a busy life, I would maybe put in like five or 10 minutes, four or five times a week. Okay, so it's not, not a massive commitment, like it's pretty easily doable. 
Yeah. And after some time, maybe you do half an hour once a week with it. And then you get like a really massive jump into a better posture. And it is really like this work is really worth doing. I've had a massive transformation in how I feel. And also kind of like my baseline embodiment has really shifted because, Mm -hmm. which is a nice thing. So uh, for for you, I would train... (laughs) Uh, a bit but let's say we have a chronic pain patient the regime is going to be completely different uh, depending right. on the state of the nervous system and ability to recover and diet and how much we have to work with the diet and you know lots of factors here so it's not like you can just say this everybody do this and you'll be fine <laughs> and you're big on diet as well like we don't really do nutrition advice on here and i don't want to get you started on the gluten again um <laughs> like 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 Maybe you could say a little bit about the relationship between diet and embodiment, because actually we haven't had like a nutritionist on or anything like that. And I know, you know, you're you're super fussy about what you eat. Uh, But to to begin with, I'm not a nutritionist. I am an experimentalist and an avid reader and uh, have studied with many, many doctors and researchers and la la la. Um, My perspective on nutrition is or my focus is to increase neuroplasticity. So your capacity to function well and to adapt and to handle stress is important and the least amounts of toxins possible so that uh, it's not a heavy load for your body, you know. Uh, I I had to do this to myself very strictly because I was very sick because I lived on sugar, dairy and gluten for like eight years in my teenage years. Uh, So I wasn't really uh, even uh, taking up any nutrients in my body. Now, if you get inflammation, that's an increased threat to your system. It increases the likelihood of pain quite a bit. And I've seen people only being successful in getting rid of chronic pain problems once they shift their diet. They can train right, they can do, have all the right habits, uh, they can deal with their mental stuff and their relationship stress, uh, but still the pain can come back if they eat something their system has a immune system response to. And I guess where I struggle with this is there's so much conflicting advice out there. And, you know, I meet people that seem to eat any old crap and seem very healthy and other people who are kind of massively controlling their diets almost neurotically mm-hmm. and you know, seem massively unhappy and unhealthy. And uh, it seems like, you know, different things work for different people. I just kind of decided to sort of generally just listen to my body and notice what makes me feel well. You know, certain correlations, like if I eat dairy, I get dry skin. And if I have too much sugar, I tend to kind of like crash off that and not have such sustainable energy. And these are things that I've noticed in my own, just in my own experimentation on myself, not so much from kind of reading research on it. Mm. So the way I I usually work with clients with nutrition is to uh, set up an experiment where the diet is pretty clean for a few weeks, uh, just to take some time to lower chronic inflammation. It might take up to six to eight weeks to to get that down. And then from that point, you can start to experiment with uh, specific foods to see how you react to it. Because you're absolutely right. It's very individual and it, it actually requires testing for each individual person and, and feeling your body and, and seeing how it affects you long term, which is the key word, because short term pleasure from food can come from stimulants in the food or other stuff. Um, and also if we crave sweets and uh, quick carbohydrates, it's kind of a warning sign to take a look at our biochemistry and uh, our, our breakfast habits, especially. Yeah, so you're, you're a big believer in sort of the high protein kind of stuff. You're a bit of a paleo boy, aren't you, in terms of... Um... Not necessarily high protein, actually. It's more high fat. Uh, I'm more of a moderate protein guy. Um, I, my relationship, my personal philosophy is uh, ancestral nutrition, uh, which is thinking about how, how would they eat, how would they live when we were hunter-gatherers. And that also depends on your background, right? Like Japanese people didn't have the same diet as Vikings. True, but we're talking much earlier than that. Oh, even earlier. Okay. Yeah, even earlier, like 200, 150,000 years ago. Because we haven't changed much genetically since then. And there's definitely variations and people thrive on different things. 
I've experimented a lot. I've been vegan, vegetarian, paleo, all kinds of isms. Um, but what I've found is that just normal, clean food that looks like it came straight from nature as much as possible is what makes me feel really good, really long term. Mm -hmm. I have much more energy. My head is way clearer. I need way less sleep, which is quite nice. Um, yeah. So it's been very easy for me to be quite relentless and strict with myself because I feel, I feel such a difference. Yeah, you're known in the EFC community as kind of an extremist around some of these things. Yeah. But I, in a way, I respect that, you know, because it's like, okay, you've done the experiments and you've seen what works for you. And then it's like, I, where I think it gets a little dangerous is when we become kind of espousing of certain philosophies. Like, okay, everyone should do this. this do that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a danger there. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm not saying everyone should do it. And um, everyone has uh, different purposes. So when, when people ask me what they should eat, I'm going to ask them, what's your aim? with your yeah. diet you yeah. know? And, and I'm, I'm not recommending people to stay on a very very clean diet for an extended amount of time because you, you go a little crazy in the society with all the temptations around so and here's the other thing I think there's real psychological costs to constantly saying no yeah and also social costs Absolutely. you know I was speaking to someone the other day they're like oh I have to tell my friends ahead of a dinner party exactly what they have to cook for me and shit I was just like you're not fucking coming to mine you know like like there's no way you know it's like yeah, I'm not taking your order so it's, it, it's there's a social cost there there's a psychological cost to being kind of countercultural. and sometimes with these things it's like which are the really big battles that I want to pick yeah. and, and which would not and, and then there's other things like you know I've been mostly sugar free for a while now like you suggested I do this experiment and I just found it kind of made me feel good. Mm -hmm. And like, I, it, after a while, it just becomes a habit. Like I haven't drunk alcohol in 10 years. So when I go into an off license, I just don't look at the beer. Because uh, it's, it's just a habit I don't have anymore to look at the alcohol. I just like, well, that aisle's not for me. Yeah. And now I'm like, okay, that sugar aisle's not for me either, which fucking narrows down the, the choices in most shops, actually. Yeah. It's like sugar, alcohol, nicotine, you know? Yeah. But uh, after a while, it just becomes like, okay, no big deal. I just don't do that. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like it's a thing I don't do. Um, I definitely had an emotional process letting go of a lot of foods when I was 18, when I had mm -hmm. to change my diet and right. my health. Uh, it took about two years, uh, uh, especially pizza. Pizza, pizza was a motherfucker. <laughs> oh, yeah. You know, you know what? Like, like, like I'm, I'm not a big fan of bread stuff because it just makes me sleepy. I don't mm -hmm. take it as extreme you do but i like for example i don't eat bread on a training day because i want to be awake in the afternoon yeah. and and pizza is that one thing that's like uh, it's got the cheese it's got the bread it's got it all going on man so yeah some some morning process going on if i had to give that up for forever but uh, yeah okay so i mean we're sort of looking at culture a little bit here so there's, there's a number of things we've discussed on the show like regularly and one of them is that we have guests from all around the world Mm -hmm. And that's another beautiful thing about the EFC community is it's so cross-cultural. And I've tried to kind of make a counterpoint. So a lot of the Americans, you know, they, they're not so multicultural, essentially. They see everything in terms of the individual and in terms of the melting pot where they do see culture. They tend to see the culture as not important. It's the individual that matters. And um, on this show, I've tried to have conversations with people like Bibiana from Spain, Israelis, Germans, Scandinavians, you know, Irish, different people from around the world, people that have lived in Japan, um, about culture. So maybe we could segue a little bit into talking about Scandinavian embodiment, because I know you've, you've got a few things to say. About. Scandinavian embodiment. Where to begin? Should we look at gender? Should we look at the, the death of the Vikings? Uh, what, what, where do you want to go with this? Like, what do you think maybe Scandinavia can teach the world about uh, about embodiment in the body? What we can teach the world? Mm, I was thinking more along the lines: what what can we learn from the world? Um, okay, well, well, what's the warning? <laughs> <laughs> the warning might be another way of looking at it. Yeah. Like, so okay, just put it that way: you've travelled a lot, man. You've lived in yeah. different places. You've done courses all over the world. Like, what are, you, what are the embodiment pieces that you see strong there in Oslo? And what are the things that you see, actually, we need to learn this? Like, for example, 
uh, you know, as a Brit, when I lived in Brazil, I was like, wow, these guys have a, a greater capacity for expressiveness than the average Brit. Now, there are individuals, but on the whole, there's a real clear difference between Brazil and the UK. Yeah. And that's something I really wanted to learn from Brazilians because I thought it was magnificent. Mm -hmm. I would say kindness and politeness and sort of sensing what the crowd wants. There's a great... I'm very good at really good at knowing the sort of like the Japanese have this a bit of that sort of social embodiment of feeling into what the group wants, right? And how to be considerate often. Yeah. It's very important to be included in Norway. So it's yeah. a small country and there's not that many of us. So if you're outside uh, the community, you're pretty fucked. You fucking communists. <laughs> okay. Necessity, bro. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I get it. I get it. I mean, the Dutch state. We had to all, you know, be together to make the dikes to hold the water back. And there's a story about where it comes from. And, mm -hmm. you know, elements are really against, you know, I was there teaching when you hosted me and I think it was November or December. Yeah. And I just, you know, Oslo is quite south in Norway, but there was still just this like icy wind hitting me and it was dark. And I just was like, fuck this. <laughs> like three days was enough for me, man. Yeah. Like that's a pretty brutal environment. It is for sure. And I mean, the, the winters vary, but uh, it, it definitely is. And, and when you stay here for a whole winter, you definitely go through somewhat of, of a process because of that uh, darkness. And you don't really realize how deep you go into that darkness in yourself, kind of, until spring comes. And you go like, Woo! and you throw all your clothes off and you dance around the fire. <laughs> and like, like you're doing at the moment. Yeah, I saw, you saw you on Facebook. Um, so, so, so there's a real sense of the seasons, isn't there? Like the dark. And I've also been to Sweden in the summer where it's like almost never fucking getting dark, you know? Mm -hmm. like, like I've been to Finland, Sweden and Norway in both in different parts of different places. But there was a huge difference between the winter and the summer. Yeah. In Britain, that difference is more moderate. Mm -hmm. True. Yeah, in, in the summer, it, it barely gets dark. So there are two very different lifestyles in the winter and in the summer in Norway. Uh, so, so you can also see that in the people sometimes, that there's a, there's a big range in some ways in, uh, b between the heavy and the light. Mm. And I, I find sometimes friendly and warm and sometimes very distant and cold. Like there's yeah. a real polarity there that I see in the same person. Exactly. You know, um, yeah. Mm. Yeah, it, it, it takes some time to become a Norwegian's best friend, but when you're their friend, you're, you're really their friend. <laughs> okay, okay. Yeah. What is your distinction between, say, Norway and, you know, your big brothers in Sweden? Like, like I probably spend more time in Sweden now. Like, what, what would be... Our, our, big, brothers, our big brothers in Sweden. Yeah. We call, we we call just, them our sweet brother. Yeah, sweet brother. Is that what you call them? Sweet brother. Söta bror. Um, well, right now, it's a big cultural difference because of their immigrant situation. Yeah, you guys have rejected that, haven't you? And, 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 and are not quite so extreme on some of the gender politics as well, from what I can gather. No, and um, I don't know. I've, it's an interesting question. I've, I've uh, driven across the border between Norway and Sweden many, many times because I've studied a lot of yoga and other courses in Sweden and uh, a, big, uh, a big farm there where they do a lot of alternative festivals. And I've been experimenting with sensing what happens from across the border. That's a great practice. Can I just offer that to any listeners? Yeah. Like when you go from London to Brighton, doesn't even have to be internationally like mm -hmm. i have this practice when i get off the train in london or brighton i'm like oh that's real different mm -hmm. you know the speed is different the energy in you know, inverted commas is different like that's a great little practice to have is to notice as you transition yeah. what changes so my, my my experience of that was that in in norway it's 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 a crisper and more blue and more open and more bright uh, and uh, in sweden it's it's more yellow and connected and more down to earth and I don't know, cozy in some ways mm. uh, but the Swedish people are very very sweet people they can be very open and very sweet and very loving and much more so than, than many Norwegians mm. uh, so there's, there's a sweetness there where we can be a bit colder and sharper and brighter perhaps 
I had this great experience in Norway of walking through the woods in the winter and there was a guy coming towards me and um, he walked right around so as not to come anywhere near me. Like he took like a detour of a hundred meters <laughs> off the path to go at a big thing around me. And so after I thought, what a weird fucking guy. How rude, you know? <laughs> Because in England, you go, well, hello, good day, you know, hello, not your head at least, you know, yeah. in that sort of situation. So I said, no, no, that was actually him being considerate of your personal space. That might be one thing, or he might have had serious social anxiety. In, in Norway, it's actually quite common courtesy to say hello when you're in nature. Not when okay. you're in the city, but when you're in nature. Same in England, like, same in England. Yeah. What you yeah. do. Uh, it's kind of disappearing, though, with the newer generation. So some people look really weird at you when you say hi, when you're skiing. Or <laughs> and so, so what, what, what does Scandinavia need to learn from the other embodiments of someone who spent time in India and, you know, China and England and America? Like, what do you, what do you, what do you feel like Scandinavia needs to learn? Uh, definitely some of the passion from South America. Uh, some of that. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, re, re, uh, retaking some of that masculine power. Uh, yeah, that, sort of, uh, we've talked a lot about the feminized kind of nature yeah. of Scandinavia. Yeah, the kind of yeah. lacking power. Like, the, where have the Vikings gone? Right, so we've talked about yeah. it before. Yeah. So there's definitely that, and I see, I see a wave of kind of new, the new man coming uh, from uh, people around me that have been working with stuff for for some time. And I think you guys are on the lead edge. I th I think yeah. kind of masculinity is being reborn from Scandinavia. I think yeah. it's almost like it got so bad that something had to be yeah. done. For you sure. Know what I, mean? like, I feel like we're just things are only just getting that crazy in the UK. Yeah. And Americans, I just I just don't see them fucking coming out of it. If I'm honest. Whereas in, whereas in Scandinavia, I see that there's something about reclaiming this Viking heritage, which is like able to be reborn in a way. And it doesn't have the sort of post-colonial guilt in the same way as America or England or other places. Yeah. I mean, it's just, I, it went to sleep a thousand years ago. So we have a bit of a different time frame to work with. Mm -hmm. It's kind of okay to bring it back when it, because nobody ever remembers how bad they were. <laughs> but you're right. There is a, an awakening of that power in the North uh, and a, re a reclaiming of that raw power. But in alignment with ethics and uh, in, in alignment with all the spiritual uh, stuff, which, which I think is very good. It's a very interesting, interesting yeah, I agree. I'm really, I, I've seen some good men's work come out of Scandinavia and some, some really positive moves there. And, you know, the women I know there who were kind of doing tantra, we had Lim, Lin on from um, Ansbacker and different people. And just a lot of the, you know, the, the more, the ones who have gone past the kind of radical feminist thing and, and now they're coming into this sort of real deep appreciation of men and a loving longing for the sort of strong uh, yang man again. Like I really see that in a positive way there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for like, sure. I, I normally divide opinion pretty badly when I'm, when I'm in Scandinavia, sort of usually half the women in the room want to kill me and half them want to fuck me. <laughs> like that's, that's normally what happens when I'm teaching them. <laughs> Yeah, sounds familiar. I've been um, also been blamed for many things after teaching in, uh, in festivals in Sweden, uh, for sure. But when they get to that point where they have developed so much that they start to really feel, I would say, reality in some ways, uh, and really start to adore men again. Yeah. Having yeah. that directed at you from someone like that, it's just the most healing thing for a Scandinavian man. I've, I've met some great women out there, some really great women out there. And if you're listening to this and you're feeling about maybe writing a letter of complaint for the sexism, don't. <laughs> we're going we're gonna to get in trouble for having this conversation. You know that, right? Like you, you even begin this conversation and you can feel those angry emails being written. <sighs> I'm, I'm kind of fine with it. I've always been a rebel and a pioneer and have a bit of a fuck you deal with it attitude uh, when it comes to my opinions around things and my feelings around things. I'm not particularly afraid to voice it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, well, maybe talk a little bit about the EFC community then as well, because that's one that you, you've been involved with, you know, kind of you know, as a staff member, as a participant for a few years now. Like, what is it that drew you to that? Because, I mean, there's loads of great stuff going on in Scandinavia. 
as you said, this cool tantra festivals and shaman groups and men's groups, like what led you to come across the sea to the UK? Well, I was at a place where I had practiced yoga for a long time. I was getting into neurology and uh, all of that stuff. And I still felt like there was something missing. And then I met you. I had a friend drag me to your workshop. <laughs> oh, come on, bro. You'll, you'll get a discount. You have to, you have to do this. Uh, super grateful to Lars uh, today for doing that and for hosting you. And just the, it was the way you talked about the body and the way you taught and the, what it made me feel and realize about myself and my body and the connection between my mind and the body. And it's like, I was an avid believer in the connection between the mind and the body, but no one had been able to demonstrate that so clearly to me not in the moment, in a first person experience uh, and how I could work with that and look at that and how that, for example, working with fire in an embodied way opened up the door to so many realizations mm. um, and insights that I, w I was just like, I'm, I'm blown away. I need to learn more of this. I need to understand this more. And how, how does this work in the brain? What's happening? And, uh, and it was also a really strong personal journey for me and a healing journey and my relationship with my body and my relationship to, to the elements in me and how I moved and, and how, how I related to to reality and saw the body and experienced the body. It was a really massive shift in, uh, in, in experience for me. Uh, and I, I noticed that you have a way of describing things in principles and in ways that open up for more insights just by presenting it in that way which I really like and I myself function in principles. Like I, if I learn something, I always turn it into a principle. When I've managed to turn that into a principle, I felt like I've really learned it. Well, I think this principle is the only way we can teach it. Cause I mean, people are coming like you and Bibiana, I just mentioned two guests who've been on recently, you're both done AFC and it's like, you guys have done some serious shit. You know, you've been to the South Shaolin Temple, you've trained with Tom Myers, you've done loads and loads of yoga in India. It's like, what are we going to do? Like, tell you, like, treat you like kids? It's got to be principle-based. Like, I just don't see a way of doing it that isn't hugely patronizing if we weren't doing it from principle-based. But as you said, the beautiful thing about that is it, it kind of opens stuff up, doesn't it? It lets people kind of explore it in their own way and kind of get creative with it, which, which is why I'm always happy that, you know, like that, that community I love to talk to because, you know, I, I can phone you up on, a, and like I did the other night, I phone you up and ask some advice on like diet and inflammation. And I said, well, give me, you said, Mark, give me an hour. I'll fucking tell you about this. You know, and he's like, you know, and then, you know, I questioned some of it and the research, but we talked about it. And it was like, okay, great. And there's now like a hundred people in the world. Well, more actually, but a hundred people have gone through the UK course that I can ask. And each one of them has at least three or four specialist subjects that they know loads more about than me. Like mm -hmm. I said, Hey, what's well, a good video I can watch on this foundation stuff or like Bibiana, I'm asking about rolfing training. You know what I mean? Or, you know, so it's, and plus all the cultural diversity that comes on top of that. And I just don't see that elsewhere. For me, it's always, it's become the community that I wanted, I wanted to have when I was younger and didn't, you know? Yeah. I mean, that's, that's also a very important aspect for me was the people that I met there. I, at the time, didn't feel like I have anyone at, sort of at my level in, uh, in, I don't know what you call doing this in English. <laughs> Um, but it was very refreshing the, the level of the conversations there and talking to people with that much experience in that many different fields and then doing the same thing together and having the same language of talking about our experiences together uh, was just so massively helpful to get that perspective for someone working 30 years in business uh, talking about the stuff in the exact same language that you now know and understand and know what that means so there's no fucking confusion about what yeah, we're talking about which is like, 
come out of the HSBC HR department for 30 years and you've just come from some tantra festival in Sweden yep. and you're able to have a shared language to have a conversation with. Yep. But also we're just ensuring that everyone on that course is already at a high level at something. Mm-hmm. Like we, what people don't realize, we turn away 50% of the applicants. Mm-hmm. Like we don't take 50% of people's money. Like because we say mm, you're a little bit too damaged or you're a little, because it's not a healing course, it's an educational course. Or we say, you know what, you're just not going to feel like that's your peer group. We want everyone to bring something to it, you know. Um, So it's very cool every year, though. You know, I'm increasingly seeing very cool groups with the online trainings as well. You know, this online training starts today. This is is not an advert, by the way, I'm listening, because it'll be too late by the time you hear this. But it's 170 people on it. Like that kind of scaling is just mad. And and you're really heavy-hitting people. Um, okay, well, it's good to hear. It's always nice to sort of see it from the outside a little bit. Um, anything else you want to talk about before we wrap up? Like a little bit more on the pain stuff? Like maybe yeah, sure. what, what should someone do if they have chronic pain? Like what do they do if someone's just like, you know what, my, I don't know, my neck is always just killing me? I start with educating them on how pain works. So I draw a little brain on a piece of paper and I... Um, draw some arrows on that pointing into the brain and out to the brain and I explain how the brain is receiving signals from the eyes and the vestibular system and the nerves in the body all the time and that is used to create um, your perception of who you are and your threat level so all the signals are interpreted by the brain and they are the brain decides whether they are a threat or an opportunity. That's the first thing that happens in the brain. So if it's decided to be a threat, it goes in what you could call a threat bucket where the brain kind of accumulates the threats to assess the, the, the general threat picture of the situation. So we have loads of threats in our modern lifestyle, which are compression from sitting, inflammation from nutrition, stress from bad relationships or bad work relationships. And <clears throat> if the total level of threats in the brain is too high, you might get chronic pain from that without there being tissue damage, uh, without it being something specific that set it off like an injury or anything like that. Uh, This explains why pain can be so incredibly difficult to treat and why so many different approaches work for so many different people. Because if you wanna deal with chronic pain, you have to lower the chronic threat level in the brain or make the brain less sensitive to the threat signals coming from the surroundings. I often wonder like, as an organism, if we can't run and fight, if we can't move, like on some level, there must be this kind of like existential threat. The whole system's just going, dude, you're weak. Yeah. Uh, and, and there's something for me about when I'm doing martial arts training, for example, I'm walking down the street. I mean, I'm not starting fights or anything, but I've, I've got this feel in my, my whole system. It's a visceral somatic feel like, hey, I can handle myself, you yeah. know? And, and there's something in that that's profoundly kind of healthy and, and reassuring. Absolutely. This is, why, this is why I'm a big proponent of martial arts in uh, a primary school for all children, every day, preferably. Um, so another thing, then we would start to, to look at the client's life. What's going on for the client? Do you hate your job? This is the most common denominator for pain in the body, for back pain. Got it. (laughs) And then looking at the structure, looking at range of motion and working with that, improving that, just to, I mean, it's long been thought that bad posture and structural problems are the cause of pain, but this is not the case. But it helps to improve posture and it helps to improve uh, the movement patterns because the brain will perceive uh, the situation as less threatening. And this is where embodiment is also very useful. Let's say, for example, you have a relationship where someone is very fiery, very intense, and you have a memory of that from your childhood, uh, from someone being very intense around you and it frightened you and you couldn't deal with that emotion and it kind of got stuck in you, in your body as 
as a chronic tension in your system because that's what we do when we don't want to feel we we tense up our bodies so <clears throat> embodiment can be useful here to to work with your relationship to fire so you could have some, some someone doing something fiery in front of you and you could use centering to change the way your system responds to that and that will decrease the threat level in the brain and that might make your pain problem better if mm -hmm. the main threat is that relationship and that fiery behavior this is just one example uh, using centering is, is something i teach every client that i have because it's a very effective you method see, yeah i just want to point listeners to the episode on centering which is one of the most downloaded episodes yeah. and Paul Linden's episode because he's, he's one of the main people i've got that from and it's it's just so useful for so many kind of clients to teach centering because like to regulate that fight flight response is like a superpower super powerful and it's like you're changing the the image your brain has of your body from a contracted one to a more open and expanded one which uh, in some cases can alleviate pain actually in most chronic cases this is not enough of course so you use manual therapy and training and other things uh, in addition to that but relearning that expansion and relaxation is so valuable for people yeah. because they get an out from habitual thought patterns or things they might be stuck in. You know, I find with any good body work, whether it's, you know, someone laying hands on me or me learning movement, there's just this sense of relaxing and open and expanding, you know, classic mm -hmm. pool stuff where the whole, and it's like, oh, oh. Yeah. And all of a sudden I'm sort of bigger and more spacious and you know, there's a very clear, even just doing it there, there's like an emotional quality of joy and connection and, oh, that comes as opposed to like, you know, yeah. kind of real, real scrunch out. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, ah. Like that's real easy for people to experiment with the basics of that. Or even just with yeah. one hand, you know, like, to have a fist and or, or you know or a contracted hand out and then to how is it to create space in the hand you know it's a little experiment listeners can do you know how do you create that space through movement through feeling through a little body work on yourself you know you can massage your hand it's like what does that look like and if you just do it with a hand and then it's like okay how would that look like in your whole body mm. so this is really like this is um one of the disciplines that we work in, with in the method that uh, I am currently writing, because uh, this is what I've been doing for the past four months, is writing an education with all this stuff. This, this is one of the things that we aim for in spatial medicine, is what it's called. Which is spatial working, medicine, what a great spatial term. Medicine, which is working with the space in the body and to create as much space uh, as possible for your skeleton. The, the techniques that we use which are neurological in nature, are triggers that response from the basal part of the brain. So the percussor, which I think you've had a session with a few years ago, the vibration oscillation tool, uh, or you can use some, you can stretch the skin and hold the skin there for the skin nerves to send a bunch of signals to the brain that the brain will per perceive as non-threatening and will then respond with a release of tension, both locally, but usually also globally in the whole body. It's a really wonderful feeling when you, when you get a treatment that is uh, attuned to trying to expand the body and soften the system. You feel amazing in the whole system after, uh, and very, very different from just working locally on muscles as you do in massage. Great. So we need to wrap up. So two final things. Um, first of all, where can people find out more about you if they want to look you up online? Right now they can't. Yeah, I, I found that. Trying to find your bio. There's no link. <laughs> but taken but uh, right around the time that this uh, podcast is being released, um, we will be. So Arch of Scandinavia is the company that I'm working on setting up right now. And we're going to be educating therapists in how to apply a holistic and science-based system to help people with chronic pain problems and also increase athletic performance. So that link's not up yet, but if people Google your name, do you want to spell it? S-I-N-D-R-E-H-A-G-H. -H. Uh, I can't fucking spell that whole name right now, dude. <laughs> <laughs> you can't spell your name. That's good. That's good. Sindra. And they can also find you. 
through the podcast because when this launches, what you can do is we'll put it on the Facebook group. My secretary will put it on the Facebook group, yeah. and you can just put the website on there because we're going to we're deliberately holding back releasing this till till that's up. Um, it's going to be like three months time from recording, so um, yeah. yeah, we can we can put that up. Yeah. Um, cool. And the final message about the body, sir, before before we head off. A final message about the body. I don't know, just take care of it and love it. <laughs> Keep it simple, man. Why not? Cinderella, thank you so much for joining us today, beautiful man. Thank you very much. If you enjoyed this episode, subscribe to get more. If you'd like to help us build the Embody Tribe, leave a review on iTunes or share this on your social media. If you're interested in training globally, sign up to receive the newsletter at embodiedfacilitator.com. Until next time, welcome home to the body.